This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Hare. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here at BrainShip. And today for our podcast, I've got a very special guest. Dr. Eric Gallo is a Technology R&D Senior Principal at Accenture Labs, working on next-generation computing technology along with sustainable smart electronics and materials for edge intelligence. Eric has a PhD in semiconductor devices, electronic materials with a concentration in low dimensional devices. He also spent seven years designing and prototyping body-worn situational awareness enhancement system for warfighters and astronauts using augmented reality and computational vision. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You know, I always like to begin these podcasts in a very casual way and assume that not everybody here knows about your company. So if you would share a little bit of information about Accenture, an organization I have a great degree of respect for, a little bit about yourself and your role in the company. Sure, happy to. So uh, I'll start big and go small. Um, Accenture is a global professional services company uh, with uh, roughly 750,000 employees worldwide uh, that provide services and solutions in strategy, consulting, technology, uh, and operations. I think the most exciting part for me is that Accenture uh, places a really strong em emphasis on innovation and bringing the best new technology to clients with a deep understanding of how it's implemented, you know, the best practices, and everything uh, that's everything's necessary to make these new technologies work. Um, and that's kind of where I come in. Um, I work in a small group called Accenture Labs, small in relation to the rest of the, um, the actual company called Accenture Labs, which is part of the broader innovation organization. Um, and in labs, we're exploring emerging trends and technologies that range from Gen AI to smart materials. And, and working on refining them and bridging the gap from, say, academia to, uh, to actual commercial, practical, real-world solutions. Um, I specifically work in a group that's called Future Technologies, um, where our objective is really creating intelligence everywhere. Uh, and this includes, uh, you know, investigating and, and looking at technologies like neuromorphic, um, but also extends to things like smart materials, biodegradable electronics, um, uh, advanced manufacturing, energy and energy harvesting. Um, and specifically, I lead the, um, the initiative that is the Next Gen Compute, which does most of our neuromorphic work. Um, but this also includes looking at um, analog computing solutions, photonic computing solutions, uh, and other pieces like that. Um, my background, as you as you mentioned, actually gives me the great opportunity to really work across all the different uh, spaces in, in my group, um, working on smart materials, um, biodegradable electronics, um, energy harvesting and everything like that. So I, I get my hands in um, a lot of stuff. So it's it's probably, it's it's pretty nice. Um, great. You have a fun job. A very interesting I, job. I, I do, in fact, have a fun job. A fun job that, you know, I get to do most of the time from the comfort of my own office in my home. So it's extra, extra special that way. That's great. That's great. Of all the things you said, though, one of the things I always love about Accenture is what you said in the early part of the introduction of the company. I always think of Accenture as being a forward-thinking company on technology, but they always focus on the business impact of it, really, which is yeah. the impact it can make on their clients. Uh, because, I mean, obviously, we're we're an organization that creates technology to create impact for our customers. So I, I love that that comment. Um, let's go ahead and start getting to a couple of questions here. Um, and I'm going to mix up the order for some of the ones that I, I sent to you, which is let's start with neuromorphic, something that I know you very well about, you know, that you know very well. Let's share your view a little bit about neuromorphic technology, the benefits and how that could work your long-term view, if you see it being mainstream use cases, wherever you want to go, but just give me your view of neuromorphic technologies. Sure, happy to. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go back to something you mentioned in my bio, that seven years that I spent building 
situational awareness systems for uh, warfighters and astronauts and firefighters and EMT. Um, you know, and in that goal, what we were trying to do is sort of leverage all this emerging technology, uh, smart sensors and uh, augmented uh, reality displays, and you know the fact that we can do night vision with a bunch of tiny cameras and all of these pieces. Um, and sort of put them on the body of the people who needed them on the go. Uh, you know, we we designed things for Air Force and um, Army, uh, for deep space flight, um, a lot of work we put into uh, firefighters. And um, in that time that I was there, I really became the systems engineer. I don't know how, it just sort of happened. It's a small, a small town in Vermont, not a lot of uh, people around. And I constantly would look and see the potential of what we could do, what we could put on the body, how much intelligence that all of these individuals could carry around. But I constantly ran into that power issue. It's like, I have it, I can put it on you. But in order for me to get all this to work, you're going to be pushing a wheelbarrow with a, with a battery. And that's really what brought me to Neuromorphic, is um, taking a look at what these capabilities are, that we, I, I could do the same amount of uh, neural processing I was doing on some of the sort of specialized chips that we were using for our designs. Um, but I could do it for a tenth of the power. Uh, and tenth of the power when neuromorphic is still young. It's still, you know, it's, it's still on its growth curve. Um, so the expectations that I have really are that um, we're going to see, we're going to see in practical implementation, 100,000 times improved power. And that opens up this amazing realm uh, to keep people safe, um, to, um, to really, my specialty at that company was situational awareness, which is just basically pulling in information, figuring out what the user needs to get, needs to know, and giving them their minimal information display. So it's not distracting, but when they need the information in front of them. And Neuromorphic is, to me, you know, the best current technology to really enable that. Um, but in my time at Accenture, I see it um, in so many other spaces. I see it as, um, uh, you know, uh, for distributed sensing, for, for you know, uh, rigging up a home so that you can have, your house can almost become alive. You know, you've got sensors everywhere. It can talk to you. It can tell you what you need. Um, but you're not, you don't need to tear out all your walls to uh, put in infrastructure so that you can have power to everything. Um, because neuromorphic can do this on energy harvesters or do it on very small batteries, um, such. Um, I see it very much as like the eyes and ears in factories, um, which, you know, can enable you to rapidly modify. I mean, one of the situations that we know is that a lot of production, you, you, it's not these factories where there's these static um, uh, machines that are just placed in one spot and they never move. These factors are being rearranged um, and being able to sort of rapidly take smart sensors and use neuromorphic computing and its low power potential to sort of like just rapidly rearrange so that you have a constant awareness of what's going on, I think is uh, another key thing. The, the last thing I would sort of pontificate on, uh, which I think is, is uh, I will say, is probably my opinion and, and not even my group's opinion, um, is that Neuromorphic also offers this really unique platform that um, when you take a look at practical devices, um, you know, the most of the, the embodied energy of sorts is often in the interfaces. It's connecting everything together because everything speaks a different language and you have to translate it and you have to, and Neuromorphic really has this uh, potential by just, you know, going to spikes or going to very simple modes of communication to make integration of everything quite seamless and quite simple to the extent that you could build biodegradable neuromorphic simple neuromorphic devices that then could say communicate with the akita directly and you've you've eliminated a lot of the infrastructure costs that it takes to implement this new technology these new technologies that's great that's great well you know you, you, let, let me dovetail on your comments a little bit about that simple integration the power savings and um use cases you know i believe and i love your comments or your thoughts on this that that's what makes it uniquely well suited to serve the edge market right and you know take computing everywhere like you said next to the sensor um give me your quick thoughts if you will about 
where we are as an industry about edge computing, early days, mid days, late days, um, what's your view? So I'm not, I'm much more of a research scientist, I think, than in the, um, in the mix of where edge computing is really being implemented. From what I know, you know, like we're, we're, we're over the peak of uh, inflated expectations in terms of edge, we're on our way um, towards the uh, um, the sort of practical systems where it's going to be you know ubiquitous and used um, everywhere. Um, but one of the things I think that I see is like this this emergence of um, an understanding that it's going to take heterogeneous a heterogeneous um, set of computing devices to really accomplish the goals optimally. Um, I think that is that's an opinion that's been expressed by um, uh, by cloud first within uh, Accenture uh, that deals a lot with uh, with edge computing, and um, and that's I think one of the things that's really exciting to me is that you know I don't think uh, von Neumann computing is going to go away, but I think it's going to give way to allow a bunch of other players that can do things better in different situations and different spots. And that you start to see this almost continuum, you know, where you have architectures that are thrive at the edge, architectures that thrive in the, in the cloud, and then you know others that maybe fill in in betweens um, and other spaces like that. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you use the word heterogeneous computing. You know, I like to say it a little more simple: the right tool for the right job, right? You know. And, and I've been in the industry a long time and, you know, things go back and forth, you know, centralized models, decentralized models, you know, of compute. But you realize the right thing is to get the right amount of compute next to the job, wherever that happens to be. And it's usually a blend of the two that usually settles on in traditional workloads. Um, and our practical experience actually on the edge right now, to your comments, your opening comments there is all companies with edge devices are examining their strategy with AI right now because they feel and they know they will be left behind if they don't offer some capabilities there. You know, computing is there now, uh, but the ability to do inference very close to the edge is something that all companies that uh, we serve are examining. So interesting phenomena. And, 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 you know, with the rise of Gen AI, you know, you artificial intelligence needs, needs information and, there's going to come a point where we, uh, you know, there's only so much information that's you can train off of YouTube and, and other spaces like that. We're going to want real time information, but we don't just like we do for our own brains. You know, we don't want to read the binary code coming out of our watch. We want to read the time and Gen AI could be the same thing where neuromorphic is just what's giving you the time or neuromorphic is sort of collecting the data and giving the key parts that are necessary for, you know, Gen AI in the cloud, or maybe even potentially, you know, running Gen, Gen AI itself. Absolutely. All right. Well, let me shift gears a little bit. You uh, recently wrote a blog about space. Um, can you share a little bit what's Accenture doing in space and what you wrote in that blog? Sure. I say that, you know, we in labs, just like I said, we, we deal with uh, intelligence everywhere, intelligence at the edge. And, you know, the 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 furthest edge you can think of at this point is is space. Um, and when we really look at what's been happening in uh, the way things are designed in space, I think most people would be surprised how little intelligence is really in space, aside from, you know, the astronauts themselves. <laughs> but um, that there's not, uh, you know, our satellites aren't smart, not in a way that we've almost become accustomed to dealing with in our everyday lives. And part of the reason for that is power. So we really see neuromorphic as this pathway to making, you know, satellites, making other um, devices in space smart without the enormous impact of energy and thermal dissipation and other things that most other existing top technologies require. So that's really, you know, our view. And, um, you know, and we, we're, we're working right now and hopefully we will accomplish it towards, you know, sort of um, demonstrating some of this real time um, with, uh, with a neuromorphic board. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And you, as you know, we have relationships with many space organizations around the world and the interest is incredibly high right now. Um, 
Yeah, it's. I, no, I, what's that? I was just going to say. I feel. I feel like it's. It's like this. A sudden wave has come over where everyone's like, "Wait, what are we doing? Why haven't we done this yet? Like, we have this technology. Why aren't we? Why aren't we making things smart? Like, um, because it's it's certainly not inaccessible at this point. It's just sort of uncharted." to to a to a large extent extent yeah great comment um so i've known you now for i don't know a year and a half two years um you had a chance to look, work with brain chip technology any comments you want to make about our company and, and the tech what you've seen um sure i'd love to um <laughs> uh yeah so i uh akita was the first piece of neuromorphic hardware that i personally became involved with i have to admit I'm not a coder. I'm you know, mainly a project manager and and uh, help come up with what we should be testing and and those sort of things. Um, uh, a teammate of mine, Noah, is the one who does most of the actual coding. Um, but I can say that you know we've had wonderful success, like really, really solid, healthy success in um, in our work that we've been doing with Akita. We we did um, some efforts. I think I mentioned in the blog where you know. In a practical real world system, not just a sort of a lab where the chip is measuring its own power, in a real world system, um, we saw a substantial drop in um, power draw for a full PC attached to an Akita, uh, you know, running an audio uh, neural network. Um, and we compared that to various other things. And, you know, we see that, um, you know, I think it was roughly uh, a quarter or a fifth of the power for the total system from the wall power that we saw. Um, and, you know, we we take a look at that because we're very interested in practical real world systems. How are these, what are these things gonna do when we put them on the factory floor or we put them in a, in a satellite? Um, you know, and those initial results were really promising. Um, I could say that, you know, you are definitely one of our favorite companies to uh to work with you guys are amazingly supportive like always willing to chat always willing to help us out and you know been uh, you know truly partnered with us in our efforts um and you know when the results weren't exactly what everybody wants them to be you know we're we're okay with that and figured out like okay what do we do what do we where do we go to make it better great great thank you for that comment well thank you that was not that was kind um all right, we're getting ready to wrap, Eric. I'm going to give you the last word. Anything you want to comment on at all about what you see in, in you know, in neuromorphic or computing or anything at all? Um, probably could talk for hours about this stuff, but um, I think I just go back to I think one of the one of my real excitements is that the that neuromorphic architecture, if you look at it as an architecture, just offers this possibility to sort of span material spaces to to span you know from you know the potential of making tiny little uh, biodegradable neurons that maybe are in a sensor that's in your water so that it can you can tell you whether there's bacteria there and then transmit to you know another um, uh, small neural network that'll say you know whether we need to panic about all the way up to you know these amazing this amazing work that's being done um like with uh you know spike spike gpt and all of these sort of large scale um efforts that they're having i i just think the whole the whole thing is really exciting i think there's a lot of space for anyone even who's not necessarily an expert in computing architecture to get involved and really understand what they can do and how they can contribute to the um to the overall effort and so that's a great way to end this because you know, what we strive for here at BrainChip is breakthrough performance, whether that's performance measured in, you know, um, FPS or power, um, as you mentioned earlier. But we, we certainly really want to make it practical and easy to adopt and easy to consume and easy to implement. So um, that's certainly something we will never stop pushing on to make it the easiest to consume. Um, Eric, I want to thank you very much for this, and I want to thank our listeners for tuning in today. As always, it's a fascinating time to have a conversation with you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. 